Hi everyone. Uh, today I want to talk about or continue uh, talking about kinds in Haskell. So, so kinds are this feature in Haskell where we can classify types according to their kind, much like we classify normal things, terms, uh, by their types. Um, and so this whole type system sort of works one level up. Last week we talked about how uh, ordinary types like list and maybe and either, uh, these really have kinds. We explored how that works. Today we're going to look at further applications of kinds um, and, and sort of two other, um, uh, two different examples of how we can use fancier kinds to express our, our programs more clearly. Um, so the first is that I want to look at set. So we can import, well, we'll have to import a qualified, import qualified data.set as set. And this allows us to talk about collections of things. So I might have s1 is going to be a set.set .set int, and s1 will say set.from list, and oh, let's just throw in some old elements here. And then, oh, come on, I'm trying to compile. Why aren't you compiling? Oh, maybe you did and I didn't notice. Okay, so now s1, uh, we see here that this is a set containing two, three, and four. So, so don't be don't be fooled. This from list down here, that's just part of the show instance for set. It's not really related to the fact that I wrote from list up here. That's just what, how, it, how it displays a set. Um, now, what we might want to do with a set is, is map some function over a set. So maybe s2 is another set of int, and s2 is going to be map of the plus one function on s1. Okay, so I can compile this, and then I can look at S2, and that's the set containing 3, 4, 5. So far, so good. But, but wait, so, so those of us who've done Haskell a little bit might know about functor. So functor gives us the fmap function, so let's look at fmap. So fmap says that for any functor f, we can take some function from A to B and essentially lift it into the functor. So for example, maybe is a functor, list is a functor, um, uh, tr most trees can be functors. So it sort of looks like set should also be a functor. So let's try this. So if I say set dot set in an S3, I'm going to do the same thing, but instead of using set dot map, I don't want to have to look up what set dot map is. I want to just say, oh, I'm just going to use fmap. So we're going to say fmap plus one of S1, and we try to compile, and we get no instance for functor set. Well, that's kind of strange. If, if we have if lists are functors, and if if maybe is a functor, maybe set should be a functor too. So uh, maybe whoever wrote data.set just forgot to do this. Let's do it ourselves. So we can say instance functor set.set .set where fmap equals set.map. So first off, let's look at the type of set.map. And does this make sense? So here uh, I see, well, yeah. Um, if we look at the type of fmap, so fmap here takes an A arrow B and goes F A F B. So in the instance for, for set here, uh, it's going to be A arrow B to set A to set B. So that looks pretty good. And oh, well, there's this constraint over here. Let's not worry about that right now. Um, so when I try to compile this, though, we see no instance for ORD B. Ah, shoot. I didn't want to have to worry about that, but now I have to. Um, the problem is, is that at this point where I'm saying fmap, we can, we, we, the, uh, the functor's fmap needs to work for any type A and any type B. Yet set, in order to have an efficient implementation, it requires that we know an ordering on the elements in the set. So to build up a set of B for some B, we need to know B's ordering, and now we can make a tree. Um, we can think binary search trees, actually a little bit more sophisticated than that. But, but that's, a, that's a good mental model, right? So, so we can't do that for any B. They have to, it has to be one that supports ordering. So it kind of looks like we can't use functor. And it turns out that that's true. We actually can't use functor. But instead of thinking about functor, I want to write a generalization of functor that we can use for set. And the idea here is that I want to be able to write a constraint um, on, the, uh, on the input and on the output, and then we can choose that when we write the instance. So let's, let's, let's explore this. So we're going to get rid of this instance. That's going to be no good. Um, and then let's comment this out for now. Okay, so now we're back to something that compiles. So what we're going to do is we're going to write a class functor C, um, which is going to be over some uh, type F, where fmap C, let's just start out with something simple, and we'll, we'll modify this as we go. So this is going to start out as the same as the built-in fmap. So now this compiles, but following on from what we did last week, we want to think what's the kind of functor C. 
Well, functor C takes one argument F. So we're going to type functor C, and it's going to be something, and it's a class constraint, so this will result in constraint. And well, what's the something? Well, it has to be something that takes a type and then produces a type, right? Because A and B are types, and then the result of this F A is, is, is a type here. So this is going to be type arrow type. Oh, and now we're going to get all kinds of complaints here. So we're going to need standalone kind signatures. That's not even down there, but I, I know we'll need it. And we also need import data.kind. There we go. That's all we need. Excellent. Um, OK, so here we still haven't really gotten anywhere because now we just have our functor. Um, and let's write our instance, though. So we're going to have functor C of set.set, .set, where fmap equals, or sorry, fmap C equals set.map. And we get the exact same error that we saw before, no instance for ORD B. So what I want to do here is I want to say in fmap C that there might be some constraint C1 that applies to A and some other constraint C2 that applies to B. We, we can imagine further things that might apply to both of them. Let, we're not going to go there right now. But I want to say C1A, C2B um, here in fmap C. And so now this fmap C might be constrained by some C1 and C2. So let's see what happens if I compile this. Well, first, we need some constraint kinds. Um, and now, now could not deduce C1 and C2. It says C10 and C20. When, when GHC has a type variable that ends in a zero like this, what it really means is that it doesn't know what it should be, but it's sort of based on C1. Um, this is one of these unification variables. Maybe I've, I've talked about these in other videos. Uh, but if we scroll down, it says, ah, it has to do with the ambiguity check. So the problem is, is that at a usage site of fmap C, let's look at, at this one. So this is going to turn out to be fmap C here. So we might look at this plus one, and we can figure out that this has to be int arrow int. And we can look at S1, and we know that that's set int. So that tells us everything we need to know about A and B and F, but it still can't tell us what C1 and C2 are. So we need to have some way of getting from the information we know, A, B, and F, to the information we don't, C1 and C2. This is exactly what a functional dependency can do. So I'm going to add whoops, C1 and C2 into the, um, the sort of the class header for functor C and add a functional dependency from F to C1 and C2. What this means is, is that if I know F, I can use F to deduce what C1 and C2 should be. So this is going to get rid of my ambiguity problem. Uh, but I'm sure it's going to introduce a bunch of other problems. So let's try to recompile and see what we get. Not a function kind constraint. Well, I don't know. Maybe we can do a slightly better job on the error message there. What it's really saying is, is that, of course, this type signature no, no longer corresponds to what we really have. Instead, we have the C1 and C2. So C1 here, well, what is that going to be? That's going to take some type A and give me back a constraint. And we're going to take C2, it also takes some type, and return a constraint. So now this is the very glorious kind of functor C. And here this, one, this kind isn't just built, out, built up out of types and arrows. There's a constraint here also. So this is the, the slightly fancier bit. Um, OK, so now we compile. And let's see, we get some funny things here. Um, too many parameters. I'll enable multi-param type classes. Well, I know it's going to ask me for functional dependencies right after that, so let's just jump to the chase. Functional dependencies implies multi-param type, um, type classes. Um, OK, so now we're getting a complaint down here because my instance doesn't match the pattern in, in the class declaration. So here, I don't want to just say functor c of set.set. .set. I have to specify what c1 and c2 are. Well, to figure this out, let's look again at the type of set.map. So set.map has no constraint on A, but an ORD constraint on B. So I don't know what C1 should be, but I know that C2 should be ORD. Now, if we think about what should C1 be, well, C1 just has to be a constraint that's always satisfied. Um, so let's make one. So we're going to have um, class always A, instance always A. This is going to work for any A. Um, now we also want to write our type sig our kind signature. So always takes a type and produces a constraint. Um, OK, so if I do this, oh, now, oh, I don't want the dot, dot, dot anymore. This is just going to be always. So if I fill that in, now we're going to get some other things here. Flexible instances, of course we need that. 
Um, okay, so far so, oh, so, oh, ha, huh, not so far so good. We're here, it works, hurrah. Um, so what's happening here is that now that I can say that f map c is constrained by ORD, that now gives us enough power to write set.map. And now that I've done that, I can uncomment this, and voila, we have S3. Um, so this is a nice way of generalizing functor so that it can work over constrained things like set. Um, okay, and again, the only re reason we can do this is because we can quantify functor C. We can abstract over these constraints, something of a rich kind. Right? We really need a kind system to be able to do this. Okay, so that's the first example. Let's go through another rather different example. So in this example, we're going to think about modular arithmetic, right? So uh, what we can, instead of just thinking of numbers as the normal integers that range from negative infinity to positive infinity, or int which ranges from, um, uh, what is int in Haskell? I guess it's 32 bits. So uh, minus 2 to the 31 to 2 to the 31 minus 1. Um, instead of thinking that, we want maybe something that, that just ranges over small integers, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, and that's it. So we're going to make this as a new type. So this is going to be a new type int mod 5, and it's going to be a new type around an int. Um, I could maybe use something smaller like a byte or something, but I'm just going to use an int for sort of familiarity. Um, and we're going to want to be able to print these out, so we're going to have deriving show. So far, so good. I can already write a kind signature. Int mod 5 is a type. And then now I want to write a num instance. So we're going to say instance num int mod 5, where... Uh, let's look at plus. So if we have a plus b, this is going to be a plus b mod 5. And let's see what happens in here. Oh, and then we get no explicit implementation for a whole bunch of other things. Um, I know I'm going to need from integer just to be able to make examples. So let's write that out. So from integer um, n is going to be muck i m of n mod 5. Oh, and now we have can't match int with integer. Um, you know, I'm just going to change this to integer to avoid things that we don't care so much about. Okay, so this loads. Let's test it. So if I write 4 plus 3 of type int mod 5, indeed I get the answer 2 out. So that's exactly what we want. Um, okay, right, because 4 plus 3 is 7, 7 mod 5 is 2. Um, but I don't want to have to do this for int mod 5 and int mod 6 and int mod 7, all that stuff. Um, and yet, and I also really don't want to mix int mod 5 with int mod 6, right? I don't even know what that would mean to add int mod 5 plus int mod 6. So I definitely want to keep these as separate types. But I want to take the 5 out of the type and make it some n. But what's the kind of n? n has to be a number. So when we have numerical types, these are in GHC have kind nat. Um, so I'm going to write this, and now here instead of int mod 5, let's just say this is int mod 5. And I think already this should work. Oh, uh, well, we need more whimwhams up here. Um, oh, and we need another whimwham down here. Uh, this is ghc.typelets. Okay, and now we're working again. Right. Again, I'm not going to write all of these methods out. Um, so does this work? Let's test it again. So 4 plus 3 of type int mod 5. Sure it does. Now let's look at 4 plus 3 of type int mod 6. Nope. The only num instance I've written is for int mod 5, so that's really no good. Instead, I want to be able to write a num instance for int mod n, for any n. Of course, now I have this problem in that I have this 5 here, so what do I want to use for 5? So we're going to need a, a function from ghc.typelets called natval. Natval has this funny type. So if I have a known nat n, so that's a class constraint that we're going to need on natval here, and then I have to pass in something, anything, that's indexed by n, that's going to produce the integer associated with that n. So if I call natval on uh, let's see, 4 of type int mod 5, that gives me 5. 
it gives me the natural value associated with this five here. So what we're really doing is we're taking a type level information, the five, this five, and producing runtime information, this, this five down here. Um, so this actually uh, maybe opens up a new possibility for a future video on what's called the phase distinction, where there's some information known at compile time, other information known at runtime, and there's mechanisms to sort of get information across this, this phase barrier. Um, we're going to come back to that a little bit more in another video. Uh, but what I really need here is instead of just hardwiring five, that's clearly wrong, I want to call natval. Um, and I need to pass in something that's indexed by n. Well, let's name this over here, and then I could just pass in i, right? i is a value that's indexed by the value n, and so that might work. Let's see, no instance for that, um, so we can add the instance here. Put in known nat n right here, and now everything is okay, except that the from integer is still clearly wrong. So instead, I want to write nat val and here I don't really have anything that I can pass, so I'll just pass undefined. It turns out that natval doesn't use this. It's just using it as a way of getting the type value in. Um, so if I type undefined of type, uh, what do I want? Int mod n, that will work, except that now it's going to probably complain about some variable that's out of scope. Oh no, it's going to be ambiguous. Um, the problem is, is that this n by default doesn't mean the same as that n unless we turn on scoped type variables. Um, and now we're okay again. So does this work? So can I write 4 plus 3 of type int mod 5? And we get 2. Excellent. Of int mod 6, we get 1. Oh, this is looking good. Int mod 4, we get 3. Aha, this is working. And of course, now we could define all of the other different uh, methods in, in num, and, and everything would work out nicely. At the same time, I can't add, if I have this uh, of int mod 5, and I try to say this of int mod 6, right, this is going to give me an error, couldn't match 6 with 5, exactly as we want. Um, so there are still a few mysteries in here. One is, what is this nat thing, and what else can we do with it? Um, and, and another mystery is about this phase distinction. So I think this makes good, sub, uh, good, good subjects for future videos. The key here is that by having, by having rich kinds, it allows me to index this int mod with a number, not just some other type, like I might have a list of something or a maybe of something. This is using the type system in a sort of a fundamentally different way to keep, to have this family of modular numbers um, while still keeping them separate but defining them just once. Um, so I hope this has been interesting. Thanks very much for watching. Bye.